All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the Northern Colorado Libraries um, webinar. Today we have Amber Webb with us. Amber is a Larimer County FCS agent. She's been with CSU Extension for a few years now, and she specializes in teaching all about food preservation. So we're really happy to have Amber with us today. I'll be your host. My name is Amy Lentz. I'm the horticulture agent in Weld County. And again, we're just very happy that you're all with us. And so with that, Amber, I'm gonna just turn it over to you. I know we've got a lot to cover today. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so go ahead and get started. Thanks, Amber. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Amy, for hosting me for this class. I'm just so excited to be able to offer this material. Um, this is such a, a timely um, lesson because everything is in season right now. All of the, our seasonal bounty is just so amazing right now in the month of, what is it, September? <laughs> and at what you can get at the farmer's markets, what you can get from your home garden, from your neighbors, um, is just incredible. And so pickling is just a lovely way to preserve that food. And so I'm really excited to share this information with you. Um, so I did want to also mention that, um, so Amy is helping me out. So she said that if you do have questions, you can enter those in the chat box. And so I'll stop um, a few times along the way to see if we have any questions. Um, and then also at the end of class, um, Amy will be sending out a, a, an email to update you to send you um, information about today's lesson. So we'll have some fact sheets that I'll share. I have a recipe to share with you. And then also I would love to hear from you if you would be willing to send out, um, fill out a short survey to let us know what you think about today's lesson so we can make it even better in the future for future participants. So with that, um, we'll just go ahead and get started. So um, as we're getting into this presentation and I'm introducing some uh, new ideas, I'd like you to think about what is it that you can take from today's presentation? Maybe it is one thing that you might like to try. Um, I'm gonna be showing you a lot of different options um, and some are pretty quick and easy, some are a little bit more involved. And so if there's just one thing you can take from today, I think that would be really wonderful. But again, remember I'll be sending you a lot of information as well. So let's go ahead and get started and send me your questions as you have them and we'll stop for a few minutes and we'll, talk, we'll chat along the way. So what is pickling? Um, let me move forward. <laughs> so I get this question a lot from people. What actually is the definition of a pickle? There's a lot of um, different ideas about what that could mean. And a pickle is really just a food that's been preserved in a brine, which is salt or salty water, um, or an acid or lemon juice or acid is lemon juice to um, preserve it. And some people um, know that some fermented foods are pickled and some pickles are fermented, but not all pickles are fermented. <laughs> you can make quick pickles just by pouring hot vinegar over your vegetables. And I'm going to talk you through that process in a little bit. Um, but those are, um, those are basically what you're getting in the grocery store when you're buying just a jar of dill pickles. They aren't actually fermented. Um, what you're getting is you're getting a hot vinegar brine. Um, and we're going to talk through specifically what those ingredients are, what the ratios are, and all of that. So the difference we just talked about, um, I'm going to talk immediately about the difference between fermented pickles and sauerkraut. So fermented pickles, you can get these in the grocery store. There are some uh, brands that are offered, um, and they're generally going to be like in a fresh deli case or something like that. Um, and they are fermented. And what that means is that they're act, the, the vegetable is actually being put in a salt solution for a couple of weeks. Um, the vegetables are producing a lactic acid. Um, they're being fermented. The pH is changing. And um, it's a completely different product than just, just vinegar, okay? So if you are interested in making fermented pickles or fermented sauerkraut specifically, I do have another presentation available for you. And that is, let me look at the date here. That's on Tuesday, October 19th um, at six o'clock in the evening. And I also have another one available online and I can send you that information as well. And that focuses just on the fermented pickle product. Um, today, we're just mostly gonna be talking about non-fermented. So I just wanted to take a moment, put that out there. There's a lot of different distinctions, um, but, um, um, there's a lot of different, beautiful ways to do it as well. Very tasty. It just depends on how much time, what you're interested in um, as far as your final product, okay? 
So there are different types of pickled vegetables out there. There are relishes and salsas. Um, this is one of my favorite things to do with fruits um, this time of year when I have apples. I love making a, a sweet and spicy apple relish. Um, so that can be a combination of um, ingredients. You can pickle fruits too. You can turn those into a relish and a salsa. Um, and you're using uh, pickles from whole or sliced fruits. Um, and you can add a, a sugary syrup to that or lemon juice or vinegar. And the combinations really are endless. And so um, at, at Extension, we have quite a few recipes available to you. And uh, I will send those, that information to you. So there's different type of pickled vegetables. Now, when you're using just a vinegar brine, there's a couple different ways you can do it. So you can do a fresh pack uh, pickled vegetable. And all that does is really, you are chopping up vegetables, you're packing them into jars, and you're adding a, a vinegar solution. So what you're doing is by adding that vinegar solution, it needs to be a 5% uh, solution or more, you are actually lowering that pH of that vegetable. And you do not want to make a quick pickle using homemade vinegar because that 5% solution that I was talking about is really important in the food safety of your final product. Um, you never want to decrease the amount of vinegar that a recipe calls for um, because that pH level is so important. You can also do low salt pickles. Um, some people have a hard time um, eating full salt versions and you can actually use a low salt or a light salt. Those products are out there to you, available to you. Um, but if you, if you are going to do that, just know that you may get a little bit different quality. They might not be as crunchy. They might taste a little bit different, um, but they are safe if you use the right kinds of ingredients. Um, and there's a lot of recipes out there available for you. Some pickle, recipe, pickle recipes do um, ask for um, uh, an alternative sweetener such as Splenda. This is a great option as well if you're not able to have a lot of sugar in your diet. And what's interesting about Splenda is they, as a company, have actually done uh, testing, um, USDA style testing that we do um, on pickled vegetables and um, pickled products. Anything that they have available to you, they've gone through rigorous testing with that low sugar um, and you should feel safe using those recipes. So refrigerator pickles. This is another category that I love to talk about. Um, these pickles aren't processed in a boiling water bath. Um, they aren't fermented. This is just a very quick and easy way to preserve extra produce that you have. Um, and in order to prevent foodborne illness, you're going to follow the same kind of um, steps that I'll be talking through in a little bit. Um, but you just want to make sure that you have the right amount of ingredients, the right type of ingredients. Not, you're not just going to be throwing anything really, really together. So um, we are going to talk through that process in just a moment. What is quick pickling? So it really is easy as this. You can wash and prepare your vegetables. You can select and measure seasonings. You pack your jars with vegetables and seasonings. You make a brine. You fill your jars with brine. You cool your jars and then refrigerate. It is that simple. <laughs> and what I'd like to show you next is actually a very quick and easy chart that you can use and that I'll get this sent to you at the end of how to do this. So for example, one of the things that I've been doing for another class where we actually do um, a demo with folks in person um, is make a refrigerator pickle of carrots, garlics, and garlic and onions. And so what we do is we use this method right here. We take a sour brine, which will yield, if with these ingredients here, six pints or three quarts of packed jars. Okay. So you know what a quart, start, a quart jar looks like. That's about two pints. Um, what you need is only about, um, if you're going to do just two quarts, you just need six carrots, half of an onion, some garlic cloves, some dried chili, some coriander seed, and then this brine right here. And it is so simple. So we literally will just cut up a couple of carrots, slice them, pack them in the jar. We'll cut up some onions, pack them in the jar, and then we'll pick and choose some of the dried herbs and spices that you see here on the right. So you can go with dry ingredients. I'm listed here, bay leaves, celery seed, dill seed is really wonderful too. Or you can use fresh ingredients 
um, for herbs and spices as well. And so really anything that you have anchoring for, anything that you have on hand, you can use a couple of tablespoons per jar. And with this method, um, you just heat up the brine, put it in there, let it sit on your countertop for a couple hours to cool down. And then if you keep these on your refrigeration, you can eat these for up to three weeks and you are good to go with that 5% acidity in your uh, brine. And it is so delicious and I can't recommend it enough. So anything that you have um, available to you that you wanna preserve and that you're gonna eat it quickly, this is a really great option. And this recipe comes from University of Maine Extension. And so I will have Amy send you out these resources to you. And I would highly encourage you to try this. And I think out of any method, this is gonna be the easiest one for you. Does anybody have any questions about this one? Let's just stop and ask real quick right here. Amy, did anything come up? Yeah, a question actually did just come in um, okay. from Tiffany. It says, should the ratio of vinegar to water always be the same? Um, and then she follows up saying, I have a recipe from Ball that I use, which indicates one cup of vinegar and two cups of water. Yes, so um, you wanna actually make sure that you have equal parts vinegar and water, and you can have more vinegar, but you do not want more water. You never want more water than there is vinegar. Um, and so Ball is, we're having a little bit of an issue with ball right now because some of their recommendations have changed, but they've not talked about the specific research that they've done to do that. Um, but up until now, about, I would say between about 95, 96 and about 2020, there's a whole host of recipes that we um, absolutely are happy with. Um, they're safe to use, but that does concern me um, because you need at least 50% vinegar, 50% water, equal parts, okay? So you could just bump that up. I don't know that that would make a, a much of a difference in the flavor. I'm confident that it wouldn't actually. So just make that equal parts and you should be good to go. Anything else, Amy? No, oh, I believe that's it for now. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we've talked about fermented pickles. We've talked about low sugar, low salt kinds of pickles. Um, and then now quick pickles, we're gonna talk about canning pickles, okay? So this is a specific method that you're gonna to need to use, specific steps, um, and that is boiling your pickles in a boiling water canner. Um, and that is once you get your recipe put together, you, you cook it, um, you're gonna put it in that canner. And what you're doing is you are preventing spoilage of bacteria, um, growth of yeast and molds, and to be shelf stable. Now, um, this is really the important thing because if you're gonna can pickles, you can can them and they will be good for up to a year. Um, and then after that, they will still be safe, but then the quality starts to, to degrade a little bit. But this again is if you wanna put this on your shelf and pull them out whenever you want, okay? Now, microorganisms are always on vegetables and water bath canning prevents the growth of those causing, a growth of those spoilage of, um, bacteria, excuse me, um, to prevent foodborne illness. Um, and again, it, in order to do that, that is the acidity and the pH is vitally important. Now, some of the resources that I talked about earlier were, are with Colorado State University Extension. We have a website that we've got all of our fact sheets on, but I wanted to mention this to you as well. We've got a Preserve Smart app, and this is something that CSU's developed, which is super exciting because this is something that we've tested in our state at all different altitudes. So what you can do is download this app, you can put in your altitude, and then you can look up recipes for food preservation, and all of the instructions will be adjusted based on your altitude, and you don't have to do that. And that's a pretty big step. And some people feel uncomfortable about it, but this app is gonna get you all set up and you don't have to worry. Um, other great places for recipes are the National Center for Home Food Preservation, so easy to preserve, which is the extension office located there, um, Ball Blue Book, and USDA guide, Complete Guide to Home Canning. This is really wonderful. You can get this in a PDF version. But then also, if you're looking for a specific recipe that you don't see here, I always like to recommend to my students that you just put in your recipe uh, request, like let's just say pickled beets or something like that, and then type in this, the Google search words, um, state extension. 
And if you do that, all of the state extension recipes will come up. And those are very trusted, very reliable sources. There's a lot of information right now that's going around about food preservation and pickling and uh, canning that is not actually safe. A lot of popular uh, media um, is, has recipes out there and they're, they're creating them for flavor and they're creating them to be really delicious, but they're not creating them to be safe. And something that I wanna mention again is because we are in Colorado, everywhere you are in the state is above 3000 feet. And that is considered above altitude. So anything that you do to preserve food is going to need some kind of adjustment that most people, pretty much everybody else in the country is not going to have to worry about. So living in Colorado does require specific considerations. Um, and so it's just not a, a good idea to just go to like a popular, you know, media outlet to get a recipe there. So what do you need to get set up for canning? for canning pickles specifically. You need to plan time and you need to plan um, in advance. So you need to estimate your time required for your canning project. Sometimes canning can take a good two, three, four hours depending on the amount of produce that you're uh, going to can and um, specifically what your recipe is. And so you need that in uninterrupted time um, because you're gonna have to boil your water, you're gonna have to process things, you're gonna need to let it cool down um, all before you're from beginning to the very end. Um, and it takes a lot more energy and time than other methods. So get all of your ducks in a row at the beginning, plan everything out, check, you know, do your checklist twice, and it can be a lot of fun. Um, and it, enlisting help from your family is also a really good idea. <laughs> Um, what's the best kind of final product that you can get from this process? And I can't, um, I can't emphasize enough that getting the best fruits and vegetables to start is going to absolutely make a difference in the end of the product that you get. Um, so you want fresh, tender, crisp vegetables, free of blemishes, um, as soon after harvesting as possible. Um, I can absolutely attest to this. There is a huge flavor and quality difference if you're getting harvesting from your garden, if you're coming from the farmer's market and going straight into your kitchen and doing this process. Um, if there's any evidence of mold, please don't do that. For, use it for food preservation. So for cucumbers specifically, you can talk to your farmer and ask for pickling cucumbers, which are just a small um, three inch size or pretty, um, pretty narrow as well, perfect for um, pickling. Um, you just want to make sure that they're unwaxed and you're not going to get that at the farmer's market. But also a really great tip is to remove a 16th of an inch of the blossom end of that cucumber, which contains enzymes that softens pickles. And so some people will talk about um, what can they do to, to make their pickles more crisp. And often if you can take off this blossom end, that's going to take care of it for you. And it is such a great little trick that's been, um, that is really helpful for your recipe. You've heard me say this multiple times, but you want to make sure that the vinegar that you have has at least 5% acidity on it. And on your label, it will say that right on the front. All vinegar, pretty much all vinegar that is distilled or like a white wine vinegar, red wine vinegar, or apple cider vinegars, the really basic ones are gonna have that acidity on it. Once you start getting into um, more I would say um, gourmet or craft kind of vinegars, sometimes you're not gonna get that 5% acidity guarantee. Um, and those aren't the ones that you're gonna to wanna to use for a specific canning project. That might be good for doing just like a, a super quick pickle for dinner. Um, you, you know, say you're making, um, I don't know, you're making pizza and you wanna put some uh, jalapenos on top. You can slice up some jalapenos, put them in a vinegar and water, while you're cooking dinner and then put those on top of your pizza afterwards. And that's a really actually great use for a vinegar that you don't know the acidity of. You're just gonna eat it fresh and be done with it. Um, but you also do wanna consider the color of your vinegar. So think of like distilled vinegar um, when pickling onions and cauliflower is a really great option. You don't want it to look cloudy because your product already is really white, right? Um, I have a recipe for, I'm trying to think of an Indian pickle that is um, cauliflower and onions, zucchini, celery and carrots. It's a beautiful color, but then you also add in turmeric, 
which turns it orange, but it's supposed to be that, that color, right? Um, you just don't want an off color where it's not called for. Um, and then um, just like I said before, make sure you have at least as much vinegar as water. Hey, Amber, we got a couple yeah. questions or a question on the vinegar. I'll save the one on the um, stevia because yeah. it looks like you might cover that in this next slide. Mm -hmm. um, but someone asks, what about apple cider vinegar? Apple cider vinegar is totally fine. Um, you should be able to get that 5% of the city guarantee on it. You're just going to want to think about what that looks like. So the cider vinegar may darken um, your final product a little bit if it's lightly colored. Um, but if you've got something like um, beets or carrots or trying to think of what else, um, anything dark colored and you don't mind, and it really, it's only going to be eaten by you and your family and maybe not as a gift, that aesthetic is really um, purely up to you, but it is safe to use at that 5% uh, level. Great. You know, maybe I should go ahead and ask this next question. You might be sure. covering it in the next yeah. slide. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, someone would like to make sweet pickles using stevia because they don't yeah. use the other ones, the yellow, pink, and blue. So is yeah. it possible to use stevia? Yes, that's a wonderful question. So there are a number of alternative sweeteners um, or sugar substitutes out there. And stevia brand is the only one that has done um, USDA safe tested canning um, for sugar substitutes. So that would be the brand that I would recommend. And we often don't recommend and we can't recommend brands, um, but because Stevia has done their research and we have vetted it, we are very happy to say that you can use those recipes. So you can go to their website, look for food preservation and get those recipes from there. Okay, great. And then one last question that came in, I think it goes back to a little bit earlier, but um, someone has a steam canner and does that still work or does everything that you're talking about today need to be in a water bath canner? Yeah, this is a really wonderful question. And I was actually just contacted by another state extension who is trying to get some answers on that. So steam canners are an available product out there. Um, other states use them, but there has been some disagreement as to whether or not they are safe to use at altitude. And our campus is actually currently working with another campus, CSU, um, to figure out if we can recommend steam canning um, in Colorado. Um, adjusted for altitude, there is some hesitancy on our end. So I can't say that I recommend it, um, but if you wanna stay tuned, um, I can maybe, if you wanna even send me your contact information, I can contact you directly to let you know what we come up with. But for this, what I'm presenting for today, this is all for water bath canning. Great, thank you. I think that's all the questions for now. Thank you, Emmy. Um, so talking about sugar, you can absolutely use a, a large variety of sugar. So brown, white, cane, or beet sugar. Um, and then uh, you can also use that substitute for stevia. But for salt, um, you just wanna make sure that you're gonna be using pickling or canning salt. Um, if you have table salt, that's something that you normally have in your house, that's totally fine. It's not good for canning because it does contain iodine and it contains anti-caking agents. And what we have found um, in our research is that those actually cloud your pickling liquid and they can actually interfere with fermentation if you're doing fermented pickles. So there is a measurable effect um, and it's not recommended. Um, you can also use sea salt and flake salt, um, but it's on a on an on weight basis. So it may affect, affect product quality. Um, so if you buy different kinds of sea salt, you will know they're not all the same. Some are very fine, some are coarse, and then some of those products actually might say they're coarse, but the coarseness is actually a lot different. I actually just learned recently that the difference between like Morton sea salt and um, blue diamond sea salt is that Morton sea salt is actually um, rolled flat. Um, whereas the blue diamond is, um, is actually like a little pyramid shapes. So like if you've seen really super fancy salts, they're different shapes. And so they're gonna be different um, weights associated with those. So one tablespoon of fine sea salt versus one tablespoon of coarse sea salt is gonna be a lot different um, and you don't wanna mess with those amounts because it can be almost as twice as salty sometimes 
And so pickling or canning salt specifically is going to get you exactly the right ratio that you need for these kinds of recipes. And you can find those available in multiple brands. We had one more question come in about those sweeteners. Um, yeah. Can you use honey as a sweetener? Not for the specific recipes that I have seen. Um, there are some canning recipes that do have honey in them, um, but mm, not any that I've seen through state extension, um, a CSU state extension. I would be happy to look that up. I'm very actually intrigued because I've had this question before and now I can't remember if I was able to find a specific recipe. I would not substitute honey for sugar if it calls for it in a recipe though. You'll need to find a recipe that does have honey specifically listed on it, okay? And I'll see if I can find a recipe that has one in it. Great, thanks Amber. Yeah, okay, make myself a note here. So we've talked about the different kinds of vinegar, right? This is one of the main ingredients in your recipe. But spices are also really important. You can substitute spices to, to your personal taste or what you have available for you on hand. So say a recipe calls for coriander and you have cumin seed instead. Um, those don't affect the pH of your product. Um, you can mix and match those without any problems. Um, dill is a really great option for spices. And some people ask, when is the best time to pick dill? And Amy, I'm sure you can attest to this. A dill plant changes quite a bit over the course of its lifespan. Um, and at one point, the flowers will begin to open and they'll turn, you know, they're bright yellow flowers. They're just beautiful, but it's not gone to seed yet. Um, if you can pick dill when the flowers begin to open, um, it's actually, you're gonna get some of the best flavor you can get for something like canning. Um, you can also use dill seed um, instead of fresh dill. Um, you just may not get the same kind of flavor. So um, that's a good thing to keep in mind. I've also just had very young, immature dill, just very light, fresh fronds. And I've put that inside of a jar of uh, quick pickles and it's fantastic. So um, those flowers are really something special though, if you can catch it at the right time. This is also something that I love to point out. So if you can see in this photo, this garlic has turned blue. <laughs> and this can even actually even happen with quick pickling. This is not even just a, an issue with canning um, garlic because what'll happen is if it's harvested fresh or if it's uncured before you put it um, in your jar, um, it will actually create a chemical reaction and turn this color. It is safe to eat. You don't have to worry about it, but some people are not interested. Um, it looks a little bit unsavory. Um, but if you know anything about growing garlic, you know that it does have to be cured um, for long-term storage. If it's cured, you shouldn't get this reaction. And you can also use um, minced garlic as well. So I mentioned this earlier, back to the crisping agents. Um, some people like to add this into their pickles. Um, to make sure that they're extra crisp because um, pickles aren't always that way. And some of the things that are the best to use would be something like a, um, a pickle crisp. And that is just calcium chloride. And that's actually, I think that's a ball uh, recipe or a ball product. And we do recommend ball products um, in canning. So I can mention that one. Um, it's just calcium chloride. It doesn't affect the pH. Um, it will make things a little bit more crisp. You can use lime, um, but it needs to be food grade. This is not a product that I've actually worked with before, um, but it's something that people have used in the past. It's safe, um, but you just need to follow very specific instructions to do so. Water is also an important thing to consider. So if you live in a place where you have hard water, it may actually cloud the brine. You may see some off flavors. You may see some discoloration. Um, and we've had some of those questions come in before. Um, so you wanna make sure that you have moderately soft water or distilled water for pickling. Um, if you don't have that available to you, you can boil your hot water for 15 minutes or you can let it sit for 24 hours, remove any scum that comes to the top, um, leave the sediment behind and use that fresh water. Um, so I just love thinking about this. People are living in all kinds of places in all kinds of altitudes, 
with different, you know, uh, ingredients available to them. Um, and so people are, have these resources available to do this safely. So just, it's always interesting to think through these um, different kinds of barriers that people have. Um, so oil, <clears throat> we've had these questions before as well. Um, you don't want to put oil in it, in your, any of your recipes, unless um, it's specifically called for. So I have seen a recipe where it was for a, um, a bruschetta and in the top you would pour a tablespoon of oil. Um, it was safe, it was delicious, but um, adding oil can absolutely change the pH of a uh, product. So you just really want to be careful with it. Okay, so we talked about packing your jar a little bit earlier. So, and that was mostly um, in regards to the refrigerator pickle that I was talking about. But if you are going to be choosing a recipe for a vinegar pickle that you're going to can, there's a couple of different ways you can do it. So in our CSU fact sheets, we have a chart that has um, the difference between hot pack, uh, excuse me, hot pack and raw pack. So if you're going to do something just very simple like um, carrots, for, for instance, without just a specific recipe, um, what you're going to do is you're going to be heating your food. Um, you bring it to a boil, you're gonna let it simmer for three to five minutes, and then you're gonna pack those, that hot food in a hot jar. So what does that do? That actually makes it so that you're gonna get more food in your jar because what happens when you cook? It softens up and it shrinks up a little bit, right? And so you can pack more food in that jar. Um, you're gonna have um, better color and nutrient retention in your vegetables. Um, and then it, you're not going to see as much floating in, in the brine as well. Um, and this is actually a really great method for boiling water. And we're going to talk about cold pack as well, or hot pack, raw pack, excuse me. Um, and then this is just chop, washing your vegetables, preparing them, um, cutting them up, and then packing them unheated in a cold jar. Um, what happens with that though? You're going to have less food in the jar because they're raw carrots, right? You have big chopped raw carrots. Um, you may get more air trapped in there because of that, because it's harder edges. They're not going to kind of soften together. And then what will happen is your fruit is actually going to float. This is also your vegetable okay, is going to float. So what will happen, you'll see, you'll get to a point, and I'm looking up here because I have some um, green beans, and I might actually just pull this down for you. This is a little bit of a difference. I'm surrounded by jars here. <laughs> so you can tell these ones were hot packed. As you can see, they start at the bottom and they go all the way to the top. And I guess I thought I maybe had a full display. Here's another one, all the way to the bottom, all the way to the top. So these were packed in hot. These were pre-cooked just a little bit, three to five minutes. If these had been picked, put in there raw, what would have happened is they would have floated and you would have seen a little bit of water down here, this empty space. And some people just don't like the aesthetic of that. They don't like that it's not as much food in there. Um, and it's really just up to you. Um, so I just wanted to kind of give you a visual of that. Um, so you could tell this is a hot pack jar. And I wish I had a, a different one for you, but it doesn't look like I do. Okay, so. Hey, Amber, we have yeah. a question come in yeah. um, about the water. Um, yeah. So someone has a whole house, and I can help you answer this maybe if, if you don't know what this is, but it's a whole house reverse osmosis water filter. Okay. So every tap in their house gives them filtered water and they wanna okay. know if that's good or bad. Um, what, do you, what do you think? <laughs> so here's what I, I can tell you. Okay. So a lot of people, um, especially the, as you move further east and you're getting into the wells where they're having to tap really deep to get to their water, um, a lot of that water is super salty and so um, super high in pH as well. And so they put on these um, reverse osmosis systems to uh, bring that pH up a little bit or down a little bit, excuse me, it's really alkaline. And so, um, yeah, so I would think that eventually though the water would be similar to normal tap water. Thank you. I appreciate that. I've actually not gotten that question before. Um, and that's really valuable input. I'm so glad you were here. <laughs> yeah. So I don't, I don't know how that would affect the canning. I think, it, I think what this person might want to do is have that water tested out of the tap 
Mm -hmm. So after it's been filtered to know what your pH is, and that might help them make those decisions of, are they getting enough acid into that yes. jar? Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Okay, so um, we are at a point where um, we've talked about the different kinds of um, ingredients that you need to can pickles, um, different um, the differences between them. And so the next step is to actually get to canning. Um, so I'm gonna walk you through this process. Um, so what you'll need, you pretty much see everything here is what you'll need. Um, something that I do wanna mention is your water bath canner is extremely heavy when it's full of water. Um, and there are a lot of different oven ranges out there. Um, a lot of people will have electric stove tops, glass stove tops, that kind of thing. If you have a large glass stove top um, and you've not canned on it before, I would highly recommend calling your manufacturer because not all units like this are safe for canning in that they can crack under the weight of your full canner <laughs> and it's happened. Um, so call your manufacturer and see if they recommend canning um, with that specific unit. Um, and you don't necessarily have to have a, a water bath canner like you see here. If you have a very large pot and you can put a jar rack in the bottom, just something that will get that glass, those glass um, mason jars up off the bottom, you can use it for canning. And so for instance, like you see here, the metal bands in this photo, if you can line some metal bands in the bottom of a pot, um, you can stick your jars on top of those, or you can use um, a trivet, like a metal trivet, um, some people have used, um, you can even like roll up aluminum foil and make a coil out of it and set your jars on top of that, um, if that's all you have available to you. So you can get creative in, in a few ways with this, um, but you'll need everything that you see here um, and then other general food preparation equipment. And that just means things like spoons and kitchen towels and things like that that you'll need. So when I was talking about the raw packed versus the hot packed foods, um, there is something to consider when you're canning. Um, you don't need to have the temperatures the same um, for those. Um, so what you'll need is if you're going to do a raw pack uh, vegetable or you know pickle, you'll need your water at 140 degrees. If you're doing hot packed food, you'll need your water at 180 degrees. Okay, so consider that. That's your first step. And then for hot pack jars, um, you're gonna heat it on hot water, not boiling, you never wanna boil those until they're ready to use. And you wanna keep, uh, by keeping your jars hot, it prevents them from breaking when hot food is added. So let's say you've got really hot food, you've got a cold jar, you can absolutely crack that um, when you add, when those two um, temperatures hit each other, okay? Um, you'll want to prepare your lids according to package directions. And the reason I'm going to talk about this is because you can see down here in the lower picture, lower right-hand side, this is a, a pot of water with the canning jar lids in it. And um, for a very long time, you had to simmer or sterilize these lids before putting them on top of your jars that were finished. But what is interesting is that the manufacturer of these, of these lids, ball, for instance, has actually changed the material, that rubber material that's on those lids that doesn't require that anymore. So you don't have to heat them anymore, actually. And it'll say right there on the jar that that's the difference. And this is a big deal for a lot of people because they've been trained for so long that you have to heat these lids or you have to boil them or sterilize them. What you need to do now is basically just wash them with hot soapy water, keep them clean, keep them dry, and when you're ready to use them, you put them on. So if you have questions about that, you, we can talk about that too. Um, and so here you can see this looks maybe like a tomato pickle or a tomato salsa recipe. You're first gonna wanna prepare your ingredients using your tested recipe. And then you've got your hot jar simmering. Um, you want to remove those from the canner and then put them out on your countertop one at a time and fill them with the head with their product um, according to the right headspace. And I do want to mention, you can see here, it looks like there's a kitchen towel underneath um, the jar. 
um, which is also important so that you're not putting your hot food in your hot jar onto your cold kitchen countertop um, because that can absolutely affect things as well. And the headspace, um, what I'm saying, what I'm talking about when I mentioned that is that each recipe will have different amount of headspace depending on the type of food, the density, and the pack style and your processing time as well. So something like a quarter inch of headspace is the smallest amount. And that is really gonna be something for like a jam or a jelly. So once your food is packed into your jars, you're gonna use your bubble um, freer or your bubble wand and move that around the jar, get some bubbles out of there. And then you'll wipe the rim of your jar, which is very important to clean that off. And then um, you'll put the lid on top of the jar and then apply a band until it's fingertip tight. And that really, it's hard to say, but really you put it on there. And once it stops, you leave it there. Um, you don't want to tighten it because air won't be able to get out. And it, um, air bubbles do need, do need to come out. It is so tempting to tilt those jars when you put them down in the canner, but it's really important not to affect that seal and that fresh um, uh, rim of the jar that you just made. Um, so once you put the, all the jars in, then your water, uh, make sure your water um, covers your jars by one to two inches. Um, add a little bit more boiling water if you need to. Um, and then you can put the lid on your canner, bring to a full rolling boil, and then set your timer to start your processing time. And I mentioned this a little bit earlier about our altitude, but here's just another reminder. Um, adjustments for are critical for safety at altitude. So you can see here on this little chart here, we are probably all on this presentation about between 3,000 and 6,000 feet. If you're not using an adjusted recipe, you're gonna to need to increase your processing time by about 10 minutes. Um, and that is because we have a lower boiling point of water at altitude. Um, and with pressure canners, you can see that's a little bit different. So that's a different presentation, but um, this is something a lot of people don't know about. So after your processing time um, is up, you wanna take off the lid, turn off the heat, and then wait five minutes before you take those jars out. Take them out um, without tilting, and then set upright on a kitchen towel, cooling rack, or cutting board to prevent um, breakage from that temperature difference. And this is a really hard part, I know, but you have to leave those jars undisturbed for 12 to 24 hours. Um, and that's really just to get the safest seal for you and to make sure that your product quality is high and that you're gonna have a long shelf life. Um, and then you want to actually take out, take off those screw bands um, after that period of time um, and just pre press, those, um, press those lids to check to see if it has indented, that it's concave, um, to make sure that they've sealed. So you're gonna put your screw band, or excuse me, you're gonna take off the screw bands for storage. Um, sometimes a jar may burst. Sometimes there may be a little bit of the product that comes out. You wanna make sure to wash those jars before you put them away in storage. Um, labeling and dating is really great um, so that you know exactly what you have and you don't lose track of that. And then you wanna store in a, in a cool, dark place. Um, and I mentioned this earlier before, but best, um, you're gonna get the best product within a year. Um, but if you go beyond that, you can, you'll just need to know that your quality of product will go down the longer that you have it, okay? And that is it for the presentation. Um, I hope that was really helpful for you. And I'd love to answer any questions if we have them. That was super, Amber. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, we do have a couple more questions that came in. Um, let's see, someone asked why, uh, let me get up to here. Why don't you boil the jars before you fill them? So you don't have to, so at one point in time, you had to sterilize your jars, um, but the recommendation is, is that if your jars are washed and clean um, and they're warm, that the, steriliz the sterilizing happens when you're actually cooking the product. So you do have to boil at sterilizing temperatures your product in order to process it. And sterilizing, tech, basically boiling your, your jars for 10 minutes is what the recommendation used to be before you did it. But you're actually at least boiling for 10 minutes during processing. And so you're eliminating that step basically and you're saving yourself a lot of time. 
Great. Good to know. Good to know. Um, here's just a personal question that I have. I've, yeah. I, I've heard that you, you can't reuse those lids. Is that correct? Once it's been used, it's one and done. That's correct. Yes. Um, okay. They are not approved to be used for more than one time. You can use them for lots of other uses, you know, reusing them for pantry items or ingredients like that, but not for candy items. Okay. And then um, someone asked, why do you remove the bands? Why not just leave them on? Yeah, that's a really great question. So there are, um, there is opportunity for the inside of your um, screw band and the top underneath part of those lids to rust um, if they don't get completely dry before you put them away for storage. Um, if you have any of uh, leftover residue from the canning process and you don't wash them all the way, um, you just keep that screw band on. Um, you can also get, um, there's opportunity for mold to grow in there. Um, and I think that, I'm trying to think, there was one other thing that even just like the way that the jars are stacked, it actually, they actually stack easier <laughs> without those bands on. Oh them. yeah. They're just yeah. not necessary. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. Good to know. Um, and then we had a question earlier about this whole recipe thing. So, um, sometimes you would say tested recipe as, a, as opposed to just calling it a regular recipe. So what and why is the difference in tested recipe versus just a regular recipe and who tests it? Yeah, that's a really great question. So state extension recipes, when we say tested recipes, they are actually performed by um, state extension specialists, food safety specialists in labs on campuses um, that can test for pH levels um, of recipes. And I, I talked about a little bit before about pH. Um, there's also other things to consider um, like um, Clostridium botulinum. So if you've heard of botulism, um, if you don't prepare recipes with the right pH and the right kinds of ingredients, so acidity and that kind of thing, um, you can produce, you can encourage the toxins that produce botulism to grow or the spores to grow. Um, and in a home setting, it can be really scary because you can do that really easily without knowing what's happening or that you're doing that. Um, and so for instance, I'm just gonna um, talk about a really recent <laughs> faux pas that we found um, as family consumer science agents. There was a chef that was on the Today Show. I think it was the Today Show. It was a morning bit and she was on and she was talking about food preservation. And she um, doesn't have any training in, in food preservation as far as we know. And so she said, here's a great thing to do with your tomatoes. Make a tomato sauce and then um, put them in a mason jar. And so she actually had a jar that was, I can't think of the name of it now, but it was just one of those lids that just kind of flops on and then you snap it shut. Um, is it a wet jar? I think, I can't think of the name of it. And she said, and then put it in the water bath um, for about 10 minutes and then it's good on your shelf. <laughs> and that, uh, it, when it hit all of our FCS agents, we just said, oh my goodness, if somebody just canned their tomato sauce and, or just made it and put it in a jar and then boiled it for 10 minutes and then put it on their shelf, that could cause a lot of sickness among people. And we were really concerned about that because there was no talk about acidity or pH or how much goes into the jar or how much water needs to be in the water bath canner or how long it needs to be boiled for, um, how to, you know, clean things to make sure they're shelf stable. But she basically said, you could put it on your shelf and eat it whenever you want. Um, and that is just not the case. And there's so much of that out there um, that it's really easy to see that and not be aware. And so that's why you're here today. Um, be aware that you can't just take a recipe and just put it in water and make it shelf stable because you can get really sick if you don't follow specific instructions. Good to know. Good to know. <laughs> we actually oh. had it taken down. So we contacted them and said, this is very unsafe. And they took it down. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I bet they got a lot of phone calls on that one. Yeah. 
Um, okay. Uh, we have a, this is a little bit longer of a question. It's a question and then a statement. I'm going to read through all of it. Okay. Um, do you recommend brining cucumbers in salt water before canning? And then there's a follow-up. It says, I've only canned pickles once just a few days ago. The recipe yeah. I followed said to soak cucumbers in salt water in the refrigerator as a way to accumulate enough cucumbers as they mature in the garden. After, br after brining, they said to rinse them and then proceed with the pickling recipe. That so is, the question is then again, yeah. do you recommend brining cucumbers in salt water before canning? I will be honest to say that I, depending on your recipe, um, the, <laughs> it is either yes or no. Um, <laughs> I know, and I know that that's so frustrating, but when you get tested recipes, um, there's different reasoning behind it. And so without seeing your recipe and seeing the full steps of instructions, I don't wanna make a recommendation to you. Um, but what I would say is take a look at the, um, the fact sheet that Amy's gonna get sent out to you and see if that one is similar. There's a couple different ones on there, um, but with pickles, I think we get more questions about pickles than anything else because there's so many ways it can go wrong um, and reasons that they, it's just this, sometimes the silliest things that I, you don't even imagine that it's possible, but here's what happened to my pickles. And we literally have, you know, pages and pages <laughs> of ways that pickles can do strange things. So, um, go with a trusted recipe. <laughs> and I will, um, if I can get in contact with you, I will see if I can answer that question for you um, with more information. Yeah. You know, one, one way to get around this might just be to leave that cucumber on the vine until you get a couple more that are ripe. Because usually you have a window yeah. of how long that fruit can sit on the vine before you have to harvest it. And so maybe instead of trying to Brian, you know, do the salt water in the refrigerator, just leave it on the vine for a yeah. little bit longer. I yeah. don't know. Uh, a few more questions have come in. Let me check the time too. We got a few more minutes. Okay. Um, how can I guarantee that I am getting a tested recipe? And I had the same exact question. So how do you yeah. know when you read that recipe, if it's tested or not? If it's coming from a state extension um, resource, you know, it's been tested. And I'll go back to, to the other ones. And then I know there's like better, there's like a ball canning guide. There's one from Better Homes and Gardens, I think. I would assume that those are all tested as well, correct? So Better Homes and Gardens is not actually. Um, ball, um, ball is, um, I'm trying to look at see what else I have up here. We just went through um, State Fair. And so we had a list of approved resources and it's not something that it's in, that's in my brain on a daily basis. Um, and Do you I have that like, list? I'm trying to think, I don't know that I can pull that up immediately, but I can send that to, yeah. as a part of what you sent to folks. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just let everybody know that the follow-up, um, it may not happen today. It might happen um, tomorrow or Friday, but we'll try to get you um, the information before the weekend. So, uh, but yeah, that might give you a little bit of time if you want to look for that resource. Yeah. Um, and, and you can, can find it. Here. Yeah, these are the other ones that we do recommend. So again, look up state extension um, and then what you're looking for. So say you're looking for a specific pickle recipe or specific jam or jelly. And what's interesting is, Think about where you are in the United States, if we're all here, but um, you know, in Colorado, maybe there's people beyond Colorado on this call. Um, State Extension specializes in their region. So let's say you have canning questions about um, fish or something on the coast, you're gonna wanna go to a State Extension website that is on the coast. Um, whereas we specialize in high altitude, um, some places like Washington will have lots more resources on apples, <laughs> things like that. So um, there is definitely a regional difference between the state extensions. And so there are some materials that are available in other places that aren't in others. We are by far not exhaustive in materials. We have a lot, but there's a lot more out there. Great. 
Okay, I don't see any more questions coming through. I'm gonna go ahead, Amber, and I'm gonna swap over the screen here. Okay. Um, I just wanna let everybody know that our next class is happening October 13th. Um, I think that's the right date. I hope I put the right date. It's the second Wednesday of the month um, at 1230, same place um, through Zoom. And we'll be talking about fall planted bulbs for spring blooms. And that'll be Allison O'Connor giving that class. Um, so yeah, I don't see any other questions that came in, Amber, but thank you. This was super informative. Um, I'm, I'm one of those newbies too. I have my water bath canner. I have yet to use it, uh, but now I think I will. <laughs> I think you've Maybe given me enough together, confidence. Do it together. <laughs> yeah. I, I'll ask this question. What's the easiest thing to pickle? Oh my goodness. One of Maybe my, that's not an easy question. <laughs> well, it is. Uh, one of my favorite things to pickle is actually beans. So like a dilly, okay. bean. dilly um, beans, dilly beans. But if you want to do like a quick pickle and eat it the next day, slice up some cucumber and some onion and put that in a jar with some dill and some garlic. And it's so delicious. I would highly recommend doing a refrigerator pickle with any kind of vegetable you like a pepper, okay. carrots, onions, beans, cucumber, zucchini, pretty much anything you can get right now. Love it. Great. Yeah, there's a lot to be had right now, too. So it's been a great, great growing season for a lot of people. So great. Well, you're getting a lot of comments and, and kudos in the chat box. I'll let you read through those. And, and for all the rest of you, thanks for joining us. Um, and we'll, maybe we'll see you next month. And just feel free to follow up with Amber or I if you have any other questions. So thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a great afternoon. Take care.